a lot of people talk about making time. In my own experience, I just feel like you can't make time. Time can only be taken. It can be taken by you or it can be taken from you. And so for me, it's about being mindful of what I'm choosing, what I'm allowing to take my time. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you're wanting to get organized, de-stress, and get more done with less anxiety in the process, then do we have the Bullet Journal Method show for you. Today, I'm speaking with Ryder Carroll, a digital product designer and author, and the creator of the Bullet Journal. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about an analog method for the digital age and how a simple journal can change your life. That plus we'll talk about Barack Obama and gray suits, a murder of crows, a grumble of pugs, a flamboyance of flamingos, what on earth is Bujo Jitsu, the danger of the Zygernick effect, the man of Oz and a very bad wizard, and what in the world robots, monsters, battle scenes, and wildly misspelled words have to do with anything. So welcome to the show, Ryder. Are you ready to shine? <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, I am. <laughs> Most welcome. Thank you so much for being here and a mighty woohoo. So before we dive right into things, as you can almost guess with a rooster in the background, I was the ADD poster child myself growing up in the 80s, even sent back to kindergarten in the first or second grade to shame me into my ways. What was your early schooling like? Oh, I mean, I guess... I had an interesting experience because I went to, to school from kindergarten through senior year in the same complex, if you will. It was an international school, so we went all the way through. And what's interesting is when you were very young, like essentially skills include like napping and drawing, which I was great at, you know. But over time, like slowly, my ability and the ability of my peers started to differ more and more and more until like it was clear that something was different about me and that's a very strange experience to make to like gradually fall behind mm -hmm. with people who you were peers with um and over time you know it just kept on getting worse and worse until clearly there was something different about me and um yeah my grades reflected that and it's uh it's hard it's hard if you don't know why you're not as good as other people that you were you know, eye to eye with not that long ago. And they start looking at you differently as well because kids are cruel and they don't understand differences very well. They don't know how to negotiate that very well. And eventually, um, my parents started looking into different ways of having me educated. So there was like a lot of after school and a lot of tutors and a lot of summer school involved until eventually, you know, we started looking into different psychologists and doctors and whatnot to see if there was something else going on there. Because one thing that people kept saying is that like, you're just not as good, right? Like you are worse, you are dumb or whatever it is. And the teachers have at least at the time, you know, this is before the internet, like they don't know what this is either. So they just assume that you're not as good. And so eventually it turned out that like, my skills were just elsewhere and that I actually did have a condition and that was AD, ADD at the time, now ADHD. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that was validating that I wasn't like alone and there was actually something very specific. On the other hand, it's terrible because now you're officially diagnosed with a condition and a condition that at the time was not very well understood, right? Like ADD at the time was a fairly new diagnosis. So there weren't a lot of resources available to me. So you kind of get this label and then what right. how, how did you since i went through the same journey in fact coached a lot of kids with this wrote a bestseller years ago college confidence with add talking about how we actually have a hyper creative mind once we figure out how to use it and you have figured out how to use it for all of us how and when were you able to start repairing your esteem or what I call the screw up gene. Like in school, if I was told, if I'm writing things and I'd end up reversing letters and they would say, slow down and pay more attention, it would fall apart on me. And so I felt that something was broken or wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. I mean, what was interesting is that I guess it's just like sheer stubbornness. Like for me, what I started doing is 
just designing these little tools and techniques to help me focus better. And the only tool I had available, which was my notebook, like I was a very artistic kid. I like to draw a lot. So I always was doodling in my notebooks and stuff like that. And then one thing I noticed early on is that there were classes where if I wasn't interested, like I just could not retain the information. Like it just wouldn't come in, you know? And like a lot of people are like, yeah, it's hard listening to boring stuff. And for me, it was like impossible. Like even if I would focus on the teacher, like it was like the peanuts, you know, it was just like noise coming out of their mouth. It just totally evaded my ability to comprehend it until I realized that if I was doodling, it would actually come in and it would make sense and I it would stick around. And then like, I would actually go from drawing into writing notes from what I was hearing. But what was interesting is that when the teacher saw me doing that, they tell me to stop because I should be paying attention. Right. And I was trying to explain to them, that's like, this is, this is how I pay attention. But you know, obviously that sounds like you're making it up until finally a teacher kind of put it together and she pulled me aside and she's like, it's interesting. Like I realized that when you're drawing, you're actually paying attention. And when you're looking at me, you're not good for you for figuring that out. And it was kind of like the first time where like an adult had given me the permission to solve my own problems. You know, I think when you're a kid and you're young, you often look up to the tall folks for answers, whether it be your teachers or your parents or your older siblings or something like, You don't really, it doesn't occur to you that you might know, that you might get it right, that, you know, nobody will know better than you. And I think that just because of like that simple exchange, like it just unlocked a whole new context for me. It's like, oh, wait, I figured out a solution that works and that's okay. And that was the beginning of it all, I think, in some way where I'm like, okay, not only did I find a solution, not only was it effective, but that means that I have the capability of doing that more often, right? And that, for a kid who keeps growing up with people telling him that he's dumb and can't do things is is really important. So I just started doing that. And over time, I started figuring out more and more ways for me to be able to focus and pay attention and get organized and enjoy the process, even when the subject matter may not have been all that enjoyable. And a lot of things didn't work. Most things didn't work. But every once in a while, something did. And eventually, I was able to gather those things. And that ultimately is what became the bullet journal method. (laughs) I want to dive into the bullet journal method. But first, I want to ask a question. Because I remember senior year English, Mr. Smith. And I I, I was making geographic, uh, uh, what do you call it? Geometric shapes I had. um, uh, I don't even remember. A stencil or something. I, I don't even remember. A protractor compass there we go that i'm making all these diagrams and drawings and to pass the class he made me give up all of my drawings and never never see them again because he said i wasn't paying attention but that was my tool for paying attention how did you make or do you make the mundane and the boring at least tolerable because your model mind i'm guessing and my model mind are exquisite for that which interests us But other than that, it's like trying to slam that square peg into a round hole. Yeah. I mean, for me, that it's more of a conceptual tool than than a physical one. For me, when I'm forced to engage with things that aren't interesting, I try to take a step back and try to see it in the larger context of what I want or what's important to me, right? So, for example, I run a business and there are plenty of parts of running a business that are as boring as it possibly can get, you know, Pain. like, look, yeah, they're just absolutely like miserable, like creating order forms or like looking up, you know, different kinds of numbers and international this and that it's, but I don't like doing that. And when I find myself really resisting it, when I find myself looking for distractions, I take a step back and remember, it's like, this is how, this is what permits you to do what you do. Right. Like it's, it's that this is the tax for being allowed to do what you do. And like all of a sudden, then does it become enjoyable? No. But does it become tolerable? Absolutely. And it helps me focus. It's just like a, it's a trick, you know, it's just trying to give yourself different tools to think and then applying them when you realize that 
you're not paying attention. <laughs> I, I, excellent. I love it. I, I call it, it reframing. I call myself an alchemist, meaning I'm continuously shifting the energy. So there's an energy to, I can't understand this, or there's an energy to boredom, or there's an energy to pain. And if you can reframe it, you can actually use that as fuel. It doesn't mean that suddenly uh, the Egyptian hieroglyphics before us suddenly make sense. But if you want it badly enough, you'll figure out a way through it. So with that said, let's talk about how you did start to make sense out of the nonsensical, because I would argue all of our minds are more distracted than ever, and all of us have way too much information. You talk about 50, 60, 70,000 thoughts. I still want to know how in the world they actually counted that number. But we have all these thoughts going on, and if we don't have a way to bring them into focus or bring clarity, ain't nothing getting done. So how did you start to devise your own organizational system? Well, I think I started focusing on the things that I was failing at the worst first, right? Like what are the things that are getting in my way constantly in a big way? You know, obviously there are plenty of things I can't do well. Most things I can't do well, like every person cannot do most things well. They have like a limited amount of ability that they can exceed at. But there's some things that require your attention and other things don't. So it was about prioritizing disabilities, I guess, in some ways. And like one thing was just following through, getting things done. That was a problem for me because I wanted to do everything all the time. Every, you know, whatever the next shiny object is, that's what would absorb my attention. I mean, that's the thing that's such a misconception about ADD, as you know, is that people think you can't focus. And like, it's not that it's just the way our focus works is different. Like the measurements aren't the same. I either can't focus or focus on something for nine hours straight. And there's like no in between. So it's, it's, it's about figuring out how I can spend more time with what I want to do. That's the easiest answer that I can. And for me, like a big part of that was actually figuring out how to just make progress consistently. Mm -hmm. So at first, Bullet Journal was very much focused about productivity. How do I organize all this chaos into something that's digestible for my mind? And when you see the design of Bullet Journal where everything is bulleted notes with like symbols, it's very visual, you know, um, it's so I can quickly grok all the things that are competing for my attention. That's the first step, right? I figured out it's like, okay, there's not a million categories of things that I need like to pay attention to. There's three, right? The things that I have to do, the things that I don't want to forget, and the things that I experience. Like all of a sudden I reduce the complexity. Right. And I reduced the complexity because I focused on what the challenge was. The challenge was I was overwhelmed. How do I make it simpler? And to make it simpler by creating categories. And, you know, I don't have to write everything down or I can't write everything down. How, how do I capture information? I keep it short. It forces my mind. And this is like another trick is the reason why we use bulleted lists in the bullet journal is because it forces you to use your own words. Right. And if you have to use your own words, then you can't tune out. Right. You actually have to listen to what's being said. You have to hear it. You have to think about it. You have to parse it. And then you have to capture it. It's a challenge. So it, it's just it's a series of little choices and little improvements. I guess that's the short answer. How do you do this? You focus on the biggest pain points and then you try to figure out ways to tackle them one piece at a time and not all at the same time. I love right? it. And, and in it's very, well, I've got my journal. Oh, I just had it in the other room. I have my, my uh, pleather bound journal in the other room that I take a pen pen and write on this term it's foreign to many people to write and what that does is it sinks it into my mind because it's kinesthetic yeah yeah i mean that's a big part of why bullet journaling is analog right like another thing for me was distraction so how do you how do you minimize distraction and for me is you limit the amount of input, right? So for me, I started using a notebook just because that was the only tool available. But as I've gotten older and we have a lot more inputs with, you know, our phones and computers and so forth, the notebook provides a place that's offline. 
I'll even call it a sanctuary. It gives you a I sanctuary like because if you had the screen open on today's modern computer, on mine certainly with this show, you will see 10, 20, 50, 70 tabs going. And each one of those tabs is taking up bandwidth. In fact, you talk about something, research here, called the, the Zygernik effect. And, and basically, that's, that's like waitresses having these orders or waiters having these orders in their heads until they offload them onto a piece of paper. And before they're offloaded, my guess is if you asked them about current affairs, if you asked them about what they're doing tonight their brains are tapioca because of what they're trying to hold on to. <laughs> and that's what's happening with us, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. I mean, you definitely have limited slots, right? In your short term memory. I believe some studies are like, there's, there's seven things you can hold on to simultaneously, except you have like hundreds of things competing for your attention. So I feel like the only way you get through it is to fully embrace the fact that you're limited. And working with that limitation, you know, no matter what your strengths are, the limitation are your time and your energy. And in that case, I think we're all equal, mm -hmm. right? So for me, I had to figure out what time and energy really means. All right, let's go there. What does time and energy really mean to you? Well, those are the only two currencies I have to invest in making my life what I want it to be. Mm -hmm. That's it, right? Those are the only two things that I have the most control over, you know, obviously things happen and I lose time, you know, things happen and I lose energy, but overall, those are the only two things I have to create with. So for me, time is absolutely critical. And like, that's the thing that gets lost. I think the easiest, just because a lot of people talk about making time. Right, like they'll, they'll make time, they'll make time. In my own experience, I just feel like you can't make time. Time can only be taken. It can be taken by you or it can be taken from you. And that's a choice that you have to make over and over and over again. And so for me, it's about being mindful of, when I, of what I'm choosing, what I'm allowing to take my time and what, who I will give my time to, what I will give my time to. So I think on those terms. And so it, mindfulness is one of the words I was going to get to, intentionality and awareness or awakenedness. What you're talking about is taking a proactive approach through life of saying, what do I want to do here? What is, I call it my SMP, what's my single-minded purpose for this day? How do I want to live this day intentionally rather than being hoovered away by everyone and everything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's that's kind of... Intentionality for me lives between productivity and mindfulness, right? So like I usually try to describe the bullet journal method as a mindfulness practice that's disguised as a productivity system. You know, on the one hand, it'll help you organize what you have to do. But more importantly, it keeps you aware of and tries to surface why you're doing what you're doing, right? To connect with the meaning behind the things that you're investing your time into. In my, in my own life, I spent a lot of time very productively working towards these goals, which I accomplished only to realize that they didn't mean anything, right? Let's talk about one of those because you learned that you were either out of alignment or it, it, it just didn't even have any juice to it. The building was cool. The after that was, huh? And that was uh, paint to pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I am a digital product designer, pretty much, you know, whatever graphic designer back in the day. And then I switched over to the digital as soon as that really became a thing. And in that world, at least at the time, the, the, the holy grail there was to own your own company, your own business, right? Because otherwise, you're always designing things for other people's visions. And there's nothing wrong with that. But mm -hmm. for me, that just seemed very limiting. So I kept on just like hopping from title to title to title, trying to get more seniority constantly. And I like every time I hopped the title, the first thing that like I remember just getting promoted and being like, hmm, now I can get to the next title. And then finally the titles kind of ran out. And I was like, okay, the next title is founder. That's the next title. So and then I can, 
make my own hours. I can, you know, I don't have to argue with people about how things need to look and all these things. So me and a uh, now friend of mine, but at the time, just a developer decided to make this company. And that's basically what I wanted. And we spent two years and this was very much a passion project. I still had a very demanding full-time career, but we spent two years, nights and weekends every day doing the thing, doing the startup thing, right? Like pizza for breakfast, sleeping under the table, you know, giving up late nights and then holidays and time with friends because this was our goal and it was important. And both of us are incredibly productive people. And we worked on this thing for two years. We finally launched it and money started rolling in. We didn't take any investors, all the things, all the things that checked all the boxes. And like, I remember so vividly when the machine was finally up and running, when this company was up and running and succeeding, I just remember being completely indifferent to the whole thing. It, like it meant nothing to me and it was really confusing. I'm like, why does this not mean anything to me? Which then led me down a series of questions, which kind of resulted in what does mean something to me? What is meaningful? You know, and that was when everything changed. Like, yes, on the one hand, I'd learned how to become productive and accomplish my goals. But then I took that productivity system and switched it around to the world inside as opposed to the world outside. And that's really where the bullet journal method became much more than what I had used it for previously, if that makes sense. Thank you for sharing. Please forgive me for, for asking if this is, if this is too personal, but sure. was this the existential dilemma? Because it's clear you've gone down the rabbit hole. It's clear you've said productivity for productivity sake is meaningless. There has mm -hmm. to be meaning behind it. Was that what switched or what drove you down the rabbit hole? I think it was a long time coming, but I feel like because of the amount of effort that was put into this and because it was very clearly a dream come true in terms of other people, right? It was very hard to deny the truth of it all, right? It's like, okay, so I did everything that I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I checked all the boxes, it's working. And I still have that feeling that it didn't matter at all, which was a feeling that I had had before throughout my career. And I was like, oh, that feeling is because I'm working for somebody else, or the feeling is because like, I don't like this project, or that feeling is because the, 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 the hours are too long. No, and the true reason was, is because I never asked myself, what do I want? What do I want? You know, like everything that I think that at the time was I just got caught up in other people's dreams in my industry, like my peers. It's like, oh, if you have a company, that's great. Or like, you know, make more money or have more power. And not, like none of those things actually mean anything to me. And that's the thing that was strange. Like all these stereotypical goals to me held no value. And yet I was pursuing them. And I don't think I'm the only one. And, you know, when I talked to my, the thing that was so ironic is I talked to my partner, he yeah. started paying a pick with me and he felt exactly the same way. Yeah. You know, both of us had this like realization together, which actually made us go from having a business relationship to actually being like lifelong friends, you know, and we look back on that as a guiding light, you know, are you trapped in this idea or is it what you actually want? So I want to dive in, into some of the some of the semi nuts and bolts. We're not going to go into the real nitty gritty details of the journal for that. Get the journal, uh, get the bullet journal. But with that said, I've had Bronnie Ware on the show and, and we're talking about lessons of the dying. And as you point out in your book, key lesson is staying true to ourselves. How did you begin to use your journal as a tool of who am I? Where do I want to go? What's my true motivation? Yeah. Um, I think at first it's like just allowing myself to ask those questions and not judge myself for not having the answer. Because when I realized I didn't know what I wanted, that was a revelation. Then what? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, where do you start? Yeah. And then I started focusing my attention on things that 
brought me a sense of purpose. Small things at first, mm -hmm. you know, I really like to help people. I really like to spend time with people who are very talented and things that I am not or things that it, these are things that are fulfilling to me. And I'm like, okay, how do I spend more time with that and less time with the things I don't? What do I want more of? What do I want less of? What are the things that I've done? And how do I feel about those things afterwards? So it was just a gradual process of cultivating self-awareness. And that didn't in any way immunize me against making mistakes or spending time that wasn't well spent, but yeah. it, it helped me switch away from this place of like self judgment mm -hmm. to curiosity, right? I would approach my failures with curiosity now, like, why didn't this work? Not like, oh, wow, I'm a failure. It's like, okay, no, why did this not work? What are you going to do better next time? And it, it shifted my whole perspective from a process driven approach to life to a purpose driven approach to life. And the way I like to separate the two things is a process driven approach to life is like, how much time will this take? Mm -hmm. Right, where a purpose-driven approach to life is like, why does this get to take my time at all? And when you start thinking on those terms, it 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 it's easier, but not easy, to keep the larger picture in mind, and also to become aware of when the larger picture starts to shift. So that's a big part of this with the journaling is be, because it's a, a very critical factor of this is the consistency. You keep checking in with yourself because you're not just writing down stuff, right? You're capturing your feelings, you're capturing your thoughts, you're capturing your experiences. It's a reflection of your life. And you can check in with that consistently. Like, oh, I feel good. And then you look into your journal and you're like, oh, actually, I'm, I don't know. My behavior is not really lining up with what I think I'm behaving like or how I feel. It's like everything's fine. Like everything's not fine. And that's okay. What are you doing about that? Right. It's just, it's this paper mirror that kind of keeps you accountable for what's going on. And that's how I started to just learn how it's literally a very gradual process. It wasn't like, what do I want? Sit down for like a month, think about it, and then pop out on the other end with like the answer to life, right? What happened was that it just gradually helped me ask better questions over time and also just gave me a platform to reconnect with myself in very small ways every day. Just do very little work, but you're doing very little work consistently and it, it compounds very quickly. Thank you. When you talk about very little work, and I would not say this guy does very little work, but it is very focused, there's Warren Buffett. And you share a story about him asking his trusty pilot, Mike Flint, some interesting questions. Yeah. So basically Warren asked him, like, what are the things that you want to accomplish? And his friend listed a whole bunch of items. And Warren basically said, okay, I think it was pick three, right? And that's your to-do list. And the rest of it is your to-don't list, more or less, right? And that that story just connected with me so much because there's so many different possibilities of things we can invest our time into. And the more we invest of ourselves into more things, the less invested we are in anything. And that that resonates with me. So I always try to spend more time with fewer things that matter more. Which means we really get to ask ourselves it, it, these two questions that you have. Does this matter to you or someone you love? And is this vital? And I think those two questions take us out of autopilot. Yeah. So a lot of times when I start talking about this stuff, people start fearing that there's going to be this existential dread every time they engage with their notebook or with their bullet journal. But it's it's really not about that. It's about asking questions over and over again you're asking small questions over and over again so it becomes easier to answer that it's easier to tap into the machinery that helps you make the decisions and one of the things that i provide is this thing called the filter so your task list your task list will be an ongoing process right you, you curate it over time and the way that you curate it is you ask yourself questions about the things that you're tasking yourself with and one of them is is it vital right and Vital things to me are usually things we don't want to do. They're like the taxes for being an adult, your rent, you know, student loans, that kind of thing. And like, those are things that 
you have to do, right? You have to continue to do. And then you, there's the more interesting question is, uh, does it matter, right? Does it matter to you or to somebody that you love? I mean, the latter one is kind of obvious. I think all of us have family obligations or obligations of people that we love that aren't necessarily exciting to us, but we know why we're doing them. We know why they matter. But what's more difficult to ascertain is what matters to us, right? And I think it's really important to ask that question over and over again. You mentioned small questions. Is that an example of a small question you'll ask daily? Or are there certain questions that you like to ask yourself day in and day out? Those questions change. I think, you know, when I was younger, I was always looking for answers. And I, as I got older, I think I looked for better questions. You know, like one of the other questions that I have for the things that continue to be undone, but kind of like start to haunt my to-do list. It's like, what would happen if this didn't get done ever? Yes. Like, what if I just didn't get done? You know, what are the consequences? You know, and the consequences can either be like, I'll get into trouble or I'll be disappointed with myself or I'll disappoint somebody else or... There are no consequences. Nothing will happen if I don't do this. And if that's the answer, then why am I doing it? Why does it get my time? How much have you learned? That's brilliant. How much have you learned from your journal that a lot of our busyness is self, what would be the word for it? Demands we place on ourselves that are completely unnecessary and are even tighter deadlines that are un uh, completely unnecessary as well. Yeah, I think that we burden ourselves with all sorts of unnecessary responsibilities. And I think a lot of times we do this because there is a vacuum of purpose, right? It's like if you're busy, then obviously your life is meaningful because there's so many things you have to do. And I don't know for... In my experience, that's just not true. It just means that you're killing time. Even if you're being productive, you can kill time. I hate, I love how you're using it, and I hate that expression because to me, killing time is I'm racing to get to the pine box. I'm not living if I'm killing time, which is why busyness particularly out Silicon Valley and some other areas, has been seen as such a badge of pride. But to me, busyness is you're not living life. Now, and this is without judgment, but if you're busy on a task that you absolutely want to do, awesome, awesome, awesome. If you're busy just to be busy, holy smokes, we need to get into a bullet journal then, don't we? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to get caught up in being busy and getting things done because there's, there's, there's momentum. And you can get trapped in momentum, right? You're like, wow, like I'm working on this big project. I'm getting all these things done. I'm getting accolades. You know, maybe I get a promotion or like, you know, all this stuff. And still waiting in the wings is this like terrible realization that at the end of that, you're going to come away with nothing really, right? And that was my life. That, that's basically, I got caught up in that all the time. It's like, I got a lot done. I got my goals, you know, it was like the stamp of productivity approval and, you know, it's, it's the investment did not pay off. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, there's also a flip side of this, you know, now that I work on something I believe in fully and that I pour myself in fully, like you can work on that to a fault also. Like when you do find something that gives you purpose, you can overdo it, you know? So it's important to keep an eye on your life. <laughs> That's, We're we're over 1,400 shows in on, on audio. When we combine audio and video and live events, we're over 2,000 shows. And so mm -hmm. in two and a half weeks, we have rented a bus-sized RV, towing a little Mini Cooper behind it, and we are kicking ourselves out. There will be a lot of journaling. There will be a lot of walking with the trees and the animals, but they will be stepping back from the busyness so we can get off of our own self-produced treadmill. Who are we? Where are we going? What in the world are we doing? Where do we want to be? Just like you're saying, asking the small but viscerally important questions. Yeah, I think it's important. It's... 
it's important to take the time to ask the questions of yourself because nobody else will. And I think that a lot of times we find ourselves asking those questions in times of crisis, you know, after the things fell through, after the thing didn't work out. And I don't know, in my own experience, it's a pretty bad place to be to ask those, <laughs> yourself those questions because you have so many things to deal with. Like, you know, either you're bankrupt or you lost someone or you're out of a job. Like, that's a hard place to get to, to, to start to create the scaffolding yeah. for, you know, your attention. So, so let's talk a little bit, I would love this, about the scaffolding of your attention. What is rapid logging? Rapid logging is a technique we use to quickly declutter our mind every day in the bullet journal. So the bullet journal has uh, this thing called the daily log. And the daily log is basically your daily inbox, if you will. So essentially, as things bubble up, you just write them down as either a task, an event, or a note. The idea is that you just offload it from your, your mind. Um, and then rapid logging is paired with this thing called daily reflection, which happens in the morning and the evening, where you actually re-engage with the content that you write. So you're not trying to be incredibly mindful or intentional or zen about the things you're writing down in your bullet journal. You're just like getting it. You're, you're, you're clearing the deck over and over and over again so you can pay attention. But at the end of the day, you come back and you actually filter through the things and examine the things that were on your mind or in many cases also on your heart because with bullet journaling you'll have an event and you can quickly write down like three things that you felt about that or a meeting and how did you feel about that and all of a sudden it gives you an opportunity to be like oh wow okay and it's a really interesting thing because with rapid logging not only are you able to pay more attention but you can also have these incredible insights all of a sudden without even knowing it like for example at the end of the day like I would feel like I wasn't very productive. Like I didn't, I just felt like I wasn't productive. And then I'd sit down with my bullet journal and go through the list of all the things I'd done. And like, I just hadn't even crossed them off yet. That's how busy I had been. And then I'm like, oh wow, I actually got five things done today. So the evidence of my productivity was there. Like I had made progress. So regardless of how I feel, the facts didn't align with that. And that was really interesting. It's like how we feel and how we behave doesn't always align or we're we we're not as a self-aware as we think we are you know and that alone has been an incredibly powerful tool for personal insight just write the things down that are on your head mind and then look at them that's simple you gave an example in the book and and i sort of latched onto this one by a gentleman by the name of Michael S. Now, be that I am a Michael S. I paid particular attention to this one. And, and Michael S. Was, got dumped by a girl. Uh, he thought things were going awesome. He sits down for dinner or something. And she's like, I'm sorry, it's over. And he's like, but, but wait, this was like the greatest relationship till Apple, since apple pie. Mm. And then he went back to his bullet journal. And the rapid logging to me, what's so cool about it is it, it's just a brain dump. You don't even have to think or register these things. And, and I think if I was right, he, he was getting, oh, that date didn't go so well and this one wasn't so great. And she picked on me here and she picked on me there. And doing that daily reflection changed everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting what the truth versus our memory of the truth like don't align often so the way you think things happened aren't necessarily true like with michael essentially he was devastated by what he considered to be a massive loss right and then on upon reflection of his daily notes he realized like this wasn't a real loss you know it's like being dumped always feels bad right but in this case it's like oh it wasn't a real loss if anything this i mean from, from what I gathered, he it helped him move on and realize that what he thought and what was were not the same thing. And having the truth written in his own hand, <laughs> written in his own hand the day of, was very helpful in helping him have a much more, I guess, truthful representation of his experience. That's what rapid logging is fun, really good for because you're creating a record of your experience. 
Awesome. And then if you don't mind going back to the beginning, I don't need to know the, the exact details of, of the, uh, the graphical representation. What are the categories that we log in? Because it's so brilliant that we're keeping them very, very simple. Things we have to do, mm -hmm. the things we don't want to forget, mm -hmm. and the things that we experience. So your tasks, notes, and events. That's it. And notes can be anything. So notes can be like an idea that you had, data that you want to collect, but it can also be like a feeling. And then you can also use these things interchangeably. So with an event, it's like, you know, went to this party and then you can nest notes underneath it. So like I felt like this way about this party or this, you know, this event, dinner date, class, you can create context very quickly. Are there other things that we want to make sure that we get in the daily log? Well, I think the daily log paired with reflection is kind of where the secret sauce happens, right? Because every day you're creating these logs and keeping lists is not new. I didn't invent that. The problem for me with lists was that they grow constantly, right? They're, they're, they're not curated. The daily log gives you an opportunity to decide what the priority is for that day, you know, because I've been bullet journaling for a long time. I consider myself a very productive person, but there's not once where I've gotten all my to-dos done in like a month or a week, right? I don't believe it's possible because the mind, if you actually were to get things done, then you would see a vacuum and the mind would say, what can I fill it with? <laughs> yeah, 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 I agree with that. There's always something else to do, right? Like there's always more work to be done. And I guess the thing about the daily log is it helps you differentiate between, between the things that can be done and the things that should be done, mm -hmm. right? And like you're asking yourself that constantly. And one thing with the daily log is that it also gives you an opportunity to say, I'm not going to do this anymore, to let go of things, right? Like this is no more, yeah, it's when you mark something as irrelevant. So you basically just cross it out. It's like, this does not get to have my attention anymore. So you get to make that choice every day if you want. And you also get to make the choice of what is the priority today. And it just like helps you consistently re-engage with the things that you're allowing into your life. Thank you. And that takes us from our daily log where we can be present here and now to our future log where we're not getting lost each day living out here. We're back here, but it's going to help draw us toward that future as well. So what can you tell us about the future log? Yeah. So the bullet journal really is a day by day sort of process every month we also have a check-in that's the monthly log so a lot of people are like well what do i do with things that are three months out or five months out which is you know usual and we all have to deal with that and for that we have the future log and the future log is essentially a place inside your notebook where you store things that are yet to happen yet that you need to do or you know events that will happen and over time what's really interesting about this is that we use the future log kind of as a time machine. It gives us a glimpse into the future that we're working towards. So we just kind of offload that for whenever that needs to happen. And every month we check the future log just to kind of see like, oh, is this something that I need to start working on now? Is this something that's relevant anymore? If it is, great. If it's not, you know, get rid of it. So it's it's... The future, all the logs, anytime you write something down, like a task, we don't, I don't perceive tasks as things you have to do in general. I Thank think you. that each task is, it's an experience waiting to be born, mm -hmm. right? Like that, that thing is going to take your time and your energy and it's going to become the substance of your future. So both in the daily log and in the monthly log and the future log, we're always asking ourselves like, is this something that I... Th is this the life that I want? Is this, is this something that is allowed to become part of my life? And that's a small question. I mean, it seems like a very big existential question, but like you ask that question all the time and it reduces the anxiety that may be associated with that question the first couple of times you ask it. I think it's empowering too. I, I've got to ask, it's off topic, but it's a, it's a spiritual audience. So, so I've got to go there. Please forgive me. Sure, you said absolutely. each task is an experience waiting to be born. And what popped into my head is, do you meditate? I do. Because you are very present with each experience. And just that line, each task in his experience waiting to be born means you have stepped back from the experience itself to watch it be birthed. 
Yeah, or to decide whether or not it will be, or you will allow it to be. And that's, that is an empowering choice. It is an empowering choice. It's a really empowering choice to just be like, no. And it's just as empowering to be like, oh, yes, I actually, you know, you get to recommit to something is, is, is powerful. And yeah, it's, it's trying to remind yourself that you have that choice over and over and over again, I think is required because we forget, I forget, <laughs> I forget, you know? So I created this not because I'm hyper productive. I didn't create this because I'm hyper knowledgeable about things. It's like, I'm not, I use this as a tool because it continues to help me. And, you know, I, I guess my job is really just trying to share the things that I find to be helpful <laughs> at the end of the day. I remember after grad school, uh, my Microsoft Outlook slash Palm Pilot blew up. And I like to say I lost a year of my life. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have, I had the meditation, I had some of the mindfulness going on, but I didn't have a tool and particularly a non-digital tool. And I feel that is so important. Actually, let's go there. We mentioned mm -hmm. at the beginning uh, uh, pixels pulling us away, but why is it so important to go analog in this digital world? Um, that is a very long conversation. There, there are a couple of things. I mean, for me, I would say, as I'd mentioned earlier, it creates a sanctuary for you to be able to think. It's mm -hmm. You take time for yourself. There's nothing vying for your attention, right? Like I've tried to do digital bullet journaling and I'm like creating some kind of life plan. And the next thing I know, I like added socks, to like my Amazon <laughs> cart. You know, it's just like, there's no friction there. And there is friction in the analog space. And I feel like that's important because it slows your mind down. It makes you think like writing by hand slows your thinking down. You're also much more intentional with the words you choose because it takes more effort. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that friction is is a feature and not a bug, right? It's, it's handwriting itself has a whole bunch of different benefits, right? It, it helps us activate different parts of our mind. It helps us retain things longer. As you said, there's also the kinesthetic learning experience. There's many different parts to handwriting that already are beneficial. And then you pair that with journaling, which on its own is also an incredibly undervalued tool i think especially in this age where everything is so fast you know like i don't think that technology is evil i do not i use it i design it i i love technology i just think that our relationship with technology is unhealthy and it's just because we don't know any better right like if, i feel like i was one of the first generations that really started using the internet and just in that short period of time they're like because i have the before and after I think that for me, I, I understand what my options are, but I feel like with the younger generations, tech is the only option. And what's really interesting with like the bullet journal community is that a lot of people who don't know anything else other than tech are going to bullet journal because they're finding that it is making them more productive, right? They're finding tools that offer an alternative. And I believe it's because in many ways, it's a much more human, human medium in terms of its speed, right? There's a concept that I teach my coaching clients and working with them all the time. I call it the Zen Jedi Knight. And that is bringing our awareness or attention here, right to the edge of a sword. When we are surrounded by pixels hitting us, bombarding us, I'm convinced that's a dopamine rush, a continuous dopamine rush. And that is taking us out of anywhere but the present. But when we get, if we, if we can imagine the old school movie, Last Samurai with uh, Tom Cruise, and he's learning calligraphy and how to be present with that writing and to be present with your bullet journal, you are becoming a Zen Jedi Knight. You are not being hit by the dopamine, which means instead of it becoming a to-do list, which will freak you out, it can actually be a tool to calm you down. Very much so. Very much so. And, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because there's like a very large part of the community that has added a lot of art to bullet journaling, right? Bullet journaling requires not an artistic bone in your body, 
but a lot of people have started making very elaborate, have very elaborate interpretations of the system. And that's why I caution people to not be too swayed by what they see on Instagram or Pinterest or something like that. Cause that's a very specific type of bullet journaling. And people always ask me, it's like, aren't they getting it wrong? And my answer is it depends, right? If they're doing it to focus and to become present and to engage with their life, like, absolutely not like it's it's i have (laughs) who am i to judge what helps you what your tools are like a big part of bullet journaling is figuring out what works for you and developing that and for some people that's bringing art in and for other people it's keeping it super clean and super minimal because that helps them focus that helps them declutter their mind and i think for me for somebody who had no idea what the bullet journal was going to turn into it's just wildly exciting how this one tool can be used in so many different ways to help people reconnect with themselves. Like that's just, it's humbling and super gratifying, but yeah, there's, I I find there's very few things that I've experienced that are more centering than putting pen to paper. Last few questions. Then I want to steer people to get your bullet journal. First off schedules. How can Mm. we use it for scheduling? Okay. So I, there's one question that I, I have to answer the, <laughs> to answer this question. People are always like, well, is it digital or is it analog? Like, which is it? And for me, it's not digital versus analog. It's about using the right tool for the job, right? Like I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use my bullet journal to schedule a flight, but I will write down my bullet journal that I need to do that. So the way that I see the bullet journal is that it's my source of truth, right? I never have to think about where to write something down anymore. It just goes into the bullet journal, which solves a bigger, more insidious problem. Like if you don't know where to write something down, this app or this calendar, you know, like if you don't know where to put something, then chances are you won't know where it is later. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, everything goes into the bullet journal. Then I find a home for it. So like with daily reflection, I'll be like, Oh, I have to schedule this thing. And then, you know, I'll put it in my Google Calendar. I live in Google Calendar. I work with different people around the world. So yeah, everything goes into the bullet journal and then it goes, it, it finds a happy home for where it needs to go. Mm-hmm. It's very much a, a hybrid productivity stack, if you will. And then there's like, obviously business development. That's another thing. So like, I know that I'm addressing relationships. Like these are different, larger blocks which i then subdivide into tasks um based on what i need to do so right now i'm I'm kind of using what do i want out of life Mm -hmm. and then time blocking is okay how do i push that forward yeah well there's there's i mean so many different people you've got to meet kaswami a famous um quantum physicist who talks about dooby dooby doo the doing versus the being you've got um uh, uh, Dr. Srini Pillay out of Harvard, who at Harvard has his book, Tinker, Dabble, Doodle, Try, and the concept that we have to get out of that busyness that will actually make us more productive. The better ideas will chase us down. Einstein's best ideas came brushing his teeth and then walking across campus. How much of that have you blocked in? Oh, I mean, it's, I, let's say I block in the time where I can tune out, right? So like I, do the business stuff until I think right now it's 7 p.m. And then after that, it's play. Mm -hmm. And for me, ideas have no anchor. I'm just one of those people who has ideas at all times. But I try to make sure that I direct my attention to different kinds of activities. So during the day, it's like, okay, here's creative stuff. Here's when I'm producing things. Here's when I'm just like crunching ideas or like working through business stuff. And then here's where like I focus on cooking or, you know, building something that has nothing to do with anything else or taking a class. And I I don't know, some kind of photography or application, something that just like takes my mind away from what it's been on. So I try to create as much mental space as I can or diversity, and hopefully something will (laughs) connect there you know like oh wow like the whole thing about you know growing mushrooms is actually related to you know 
the interconnectedness of different ideas and mycelial networks. And like, I don't know. It's just like, oh, wow. Oh, I like, like that. All nice it's all connected with mycelium. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, I, I never know where the idea will come from. So I try to put myself in the way of different things. And time blocking helps with that because I take time to do that. Very, very cool. So from time blocking and myocelium, where can people go to find the bullet journal and to find out more? Bulletjournal.com. That seems pretty simple. If you didn't catch bulletjournal.com, come on over to inspirenationshow.com and we'll get you over to bulletjournal.com. Ryder, this has been fantastic. This has been so much more of a, a a Zen interview than I ever expected would be. I have really enjoyed this. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? I guess if people are interested in this, my my tip would just be to take it slow and be patient with yourself. You know, start simple. And I think the simplest way to start is just to write down your thoughts. That's the first step. You know, there's a lot of different bullet journal information out there, but the first one is just to, you know, start getting in the habit of writing down your thoughts. So take it slow. Don't judge yourself and approach these things with curiosity. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for being here, writer. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the bullet journal and begin journaling and changing your life today and shine bright. Woohoo! Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this latest interview as much as I did. For more on how you can up-level your life, click on the links below for our mini masterclasses, for our boot camps, and for a very limited availability one-on-one coaching with me. Be sure to give this a huge thumbs up if you like this. Leave your comments below and you can check out more amazing videos here and here. Love you guys so, so much. Shine bright. Woohoo!